I'm going live right now, um, and then we'll just wait for people to jump on. So we're live right now, guys. So let's give it a minute. And uh, happy birthday, Thatch, baby! Happy birthday, baby. Five oh, baby! 5-0, let's go! Let's go! 5-0, let's go! You know what? Who knows? I realize I realized I have a long way to go to get that thatch uh, cash flow by the time I'm 50 because I'm shoot I only got seven or eight eight years to catch that cash flow train. <laughs> Tell them that anything is possible, right? Tell them about anything possible. Is possible, baby. Anything is possible. That's awesome. Dream big with thatch. That's, That's it. Right. That's it. So what did you do on your birthday, Thatch? Just because we're waiting, we're live, but just because people are jumping on, we're not going to jump into the show. What did you do? Tell us about your birthday. Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, on Sunday, on Monday was my birthday, but on Sunday, I was just messing around the, the house, and then uh, I just noticed Cam and Russell, you know, running in and out of the house, just doing things. I'm thinking, what are these guys doing, right? I paid no attention, and about 2 o'clock, she said, hey, come outside. I want to show you something. So I go outside, and they have, you know, all the signs and everything decorated, and next time I knew, I turned around, and then this whole caravan of cars just kept coming through uh, uh, where I live. And it was all my friends, you know, from back in the day to today. And uh, and they just did a beautiful caravan that, you know, they had these beautiful signs. And they surprised me. And they all stopped by and said hi. And then um, then we had, you know, we had a big sushi dinner that night with the family. And then on Monday, uh, you know, I wanted to do a big birthday party, 50th birthday party in Seattle for all my friends in Seattle. But that whole plan got messed up. So I did a big Instagram hang out and how everybody on Instagram came out and we had a hell of people on there and uh they just uh you know asked me questions you know well, you know what was it like when it's 50 and what am, what am I gonna do next in the next 10 years and we just had a good time just hanging out for an hour I love it dude you're such an inspiration bro I love you and you're such an inspiration that was cool they did a full-on parade Michael they did like <laughs> literally it looked like a car show <laughs> wow. in the cars all different kinds of cars but it looked like the video that they had, it was literally a car show. It was a parade on Sunday in his neighborhood. Nice. All his friends coming through. And yeah, man, that's awesome. It, it was cool. Uh, my friend, Lorenz, he worked with me. And so he had it all videotaped because he, he he was part of the surprise. <laughs> yeah. He recorded everything and then created a beautiful video of the whole thing. It was awesome. Nice. I love it. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, I just want to awesome. uh, shout out. So Brian Davila. Davila He's on here. Happy up, birthday, Brian? Patch. Eric hey, O'Connor, happy you. We see you, Eric. Adrian Hernandez, there he is. There's a couple other guys. There, there's an exciting group. Mike Cava, good to see you, bro. We got to connect. I apologize. I've been slammed, but we are going to connect. I'll text you. What's up, Miguel? Good to see you. Who else is out there, Bo? There oh, we yeah. go. Eric okay. Elegato, I love it. Hey, Eric, what up, dude? Danny, what up? what up? What's up, Corey Griffin from uh, Savannah, Georgia? All right. There we go. We we got uh, Danny, uh, Ty, Danny's online, ready to ask questions. Teddy, uh, Rachel Boston, or, or Rosh Boston? Oh, Rache Boston. Rache Boston. Sorry about that, Rache. So we got a bunch of people that are coming on to like, ask questions and uh, I love it. We're, we're, I love it. So here's how we're going to do questions too, by the way, we're going to have questions in the comment bar. Like we always do, like we've done in the past, but the cool thing we're going to do today, that's a little different and it'll be new for us because we haven't done this yet, but I've seen other people do it and it's super cool where what I want you to do is you'll see if you take the banner down bow and it'll show the, will it show the, yeah, there you go. So, that's my Instagram handle, ty underscore lg. If you go there, send me an instant message. Okay, you're gonna send me an instant message or DM. Send me a DM that you have a question, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start selecting you. What I will do is if you have a question, we're gonna bring you on live onto the feed. So you'll be the four of us, and then it'll be you. You'll be on live, and then you'll get to ask Michael or Thatch your question talk with us for a few more minutes, you'll drop off, and then I'm, I'm gonna have one or two other people behind you queued up. So I'm gonna DJ the, between Bo and I, we're gonna DJ the live questions, and we wanna, we, we've never done it, so we think it'll be super cool to actually just bring you on like a guest, you know, like we're bringing you in live, 
from <laughs> CNN or from Fox News or whatever news you you know it'll be cool. You'll be one. You'll be on here. And also too, we want to shout you guys out too. So you know, please hit me up. Hit me up right now. So ty underscore lg on Instagram. So keep your live feed going on Facebook, but just go to Instagram, send me that, and then I'll just start sending the link. Okay. Cool. You want to start us off, Bo? Are we ready to go, or we want to wait a few more minutes? Uh, yeah, we can we can get started here because uh, you know people will be added in here. Well, guys, thanks for whoever's on watching in the different uh, places in the online world. Today is going to be the hottest uh, uh, survive and thrive night I think we've had in the, ever in the history of the last uh, what has it been eight weeks of doing these uh, survive and thrives. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ty because he's always bringing a lot of energy and bringing great guests, uh, people that I haven't uh, known and I'm getting to know over, over the time. So it's great. And I think this is a great platform. We, we got uh, Thatch in the house. Everybody knows Thatch. Everybody knows Michael. Yeah. And, and, it, and we're just bring, we're representing all over Henderson, Nevada. We got, you know, Solano County. We got Washington. We got Silicon Valley. Uh, we got people online from everywhere, and uh, you know, I just, I just really enjoy doing these, and I've, I've learned so much over the last eight weeks, and I'm going to continue. And, and really, what I've learned, I think the biggest thing I've, I've, my biggest takeaway is really, guys, like if you follow all these people that have come, come on, they're, they're focused, right? They go after it every day. They're relentless, and that's the real key. I don't think there's, I think we can keep learning and learning and learning, but if you're not relentless and going after it and door knocking, you know, um, you're not going to get the deals, guys. You're not going to get the deals. And, and I'm, I want to get the deals. And I, my, my business over the last eight weeks, because of these calls, ha has tremendously, I mean, I've grown so much. I can't even tell you. I've, I've, I've partnered with people. Uh, I mean, yesterday, for example, I got $30 million in new uh, potential loan funding in one day. Nice. You know, that's huge money, huge money. I've partnered with uh, different lenders where I can offer better products. It's just, it's been a really, really phenomenal eight weeks. And, and I, I have to first shout out to Ty because Ty was the one who said we should do these survive and thrive and, and it's just grown and it's been really fun. And, and the world's going to come back to normal to a certain degree now, I think for summer, but uh, I've really enjoyed doing this. Ty, why don't you take it from here? Cool. So thank you, Bo. Obviously, Bo, you know, has both been having a real estate investment club going for several, several years since I've known Bo, probably the last seven, eight years. Plus, he's had investment clubs. I got a chance to meet Michael at one of those uh, meetups where he did an all day event. Super cool. Um, Michael has a lot of wisdom. The guy uh, is a buy and hold investor. He's created a lot of wealth and passive income. He wrote a book. He's an author, one rental at a time. Um, I want to also just shout out to Thatch. Thatch is somebody, a brother that I've known Thatch now for almost three decades. And, you know, Thatch and I met at a Mike Ferry sales training realtor event. And it's beautiful because I love how Thatch like explains, you know, some of us were going this way and, and Thatch was so clear about what he was doing in the investment game and wealth creation and passive income. And I'm going to have them just share in free, free flow, but I just want to, um, Again, remind everybody, please, if you have questions, post them in the comments. For some of you, if you want to, I know I had a handful of guys that are going to hit me up on Instagram, guys or gals. I'm going to send you the link. There's a link here. I'll send you the link, and we're going to bring you on live to the show. But, hey, Michael Zuber, welcome to the show. Ty, Ty both facts. Thank you very much for being here. Quite the honor to be, uh, be speaking with the three of you. I love it. So for people that missed last week, I said that last week was one of the best shows. All the shows were great. I love what you were talking about. And so just share with them where you're from and kind of what is your real estate kind of in a in a condensed version. What are you up to in real estate? Yeah, so I'm certainly a buy and hold investor, but I'm, I'm kind of unique versus all the gurus out there in that I started my career of buy and hold investing when I was 30 years old after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, you know, I had an epiphany that I didn't want to be climb the corporate ladder, be one of those VPs in my organization who I saw were unhealthy and bad relationships and addicted to substances that I didn't want to play with. So I had to do something else. Right. I was in a high stress job. It took me all over the world and I just couldn't do it for th three decades. So I started one rental at a time. I live in the Silicon Valley. 
Uh, it doesn't make sense to invest in the Silicon Valley as a buy and hold investor if you want positive cash flow. Uh, I do not bet on appreciation. It's not part of my equation. So I started with a single house in Fresno, California in 2000, late 2002. I rode that first wave to eight houses. Uh, because I was watching the market, I was able to exit or 1031 exchange out of houses to small apartments. Eight turned to 80. The market crashed. Uh, you know, I had an 800 credit score, seven figure net worth, six figure income and banks said no. Mm. So when banks say no, it's not uncommon to me. I've been there before. So we did hard money and private money and we bought hand over fist 40 transactions in 2010 alone. Uh, because they were li literally given real estate away from houses to apartments. And then we rode the way back up. And then most recently, I, you know, I take credit for call-in multifamily. And we exited uh, a decent part of our multifamily in late 2019 and now have a bunch of cash ready to uh, pounce uh, in single family, where I think the opportunity is for the next decade or so. So buy and hold, full-time employee. I was a full-time employee in tech for uh, until I was 45, so 15 years. Um, never had a real estate, wasn't a real estate investor. Nobody in my family had any money. I didn't even, I never spent the night in Fresno. Um, so if I can do it, anybody can. I love it. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. For some of the people, Pat, that don't know you and know your, you know, kind of who you are, where you're at. I mean, I, I think a lot of people do know you, but just, there might be a few people out there, you know, that don't know what you're up to and kind of how you're, what are you doing in the real estate game? And maybe a little bit of backstory too, please. Yeah. So for all you guys who don't know me, um, you know, I came from Vietnam with my family over here with basically uh, one suitcase and hundred dollars. We lived in homeless shelter. So I, I, I literally started from the bottom up. Um, and um, I got into real estate sales at 21 by default. Um, and then um, I met Mike Ferry in, uh, uh, in 94 when I was 20, four years old. And then he taught me how to go out there and sell real estate. And that was my Vigo to make cash. Cause I didn't, you know, I was working at Safeway and parking car at, at a Chinese restaurant. And so selling real estate at that time, I just didn't know no better. I was like, okay, I want to make some money. But the thing when I realized selling real estate gave me a couple of things, cash, which I needed to invest, which I didn't know, cause no one taught me that. And then two, it gave me the knowledge about the basic of real estate I need to know right? Especially if you're going to invest. And so uh, I was so focused on selling real estate. I've made a lot of money selling real estate. Uh, I made, you know, I made a million bucks a year selling real estate when I was like 27, 28 years old. And then from there, one of my good mentors says, look, you can be rich selling real estate, but you only can be wealthy if you own real estate. So if you really want to have a retirement plan, have the option to work when you want to work, where you want to work, however you want to work, when you get to an age of, you know, at that time, Saul was like 45, 46 years old. I was like 27 years old. And he said, when you get to my age, 45, 46, you want to have the option not to work, buddy. And then if you got kids and you got baseball practice and soccer game, you want to be at their practice game because that's the best reward you can ever do, more than money can ever, ever do. And my wife, Cammy just heard it loud and clear. And so from that point on, real estate sale became a vehicle to just crush it so I can make money so I can own real estate. And so I bought my first rental house, you guys, in um, when I was 27 years old for 105. I still own it today, free and clear, worth like $700,000. And I just started buying a lot of single family homes because that's what I knew because I was selling residential real estate. And then eventually I transitioned into uh, townhouses because I was, I was working with builders in Seattle and I was selling them land. I see them build these townhouses and I see how much they cost in the bill. And I see what it cost to rent. And I was like, wow, when I got en enough education on it, I started building townhouses. And I was still buying single family house, townhouses. And then eventually um, I met some other friends and they were building apartment building, big apartment building. And they asked me to partner with them because I had the money, I had the real estate knowledge. I didn't have the experience of building a big apartment building. And I partnered with them. And so fast forward today, you guys, I still sell real estate because that's my my vehicle to bring in a lot of cash to the front door so I can buy property. And some of you guys, we're going to talk more about that, but the next 10 years, I'm 60 years old. But when I get 60, my goal is to actually pay up all my property by the time I get 60, so I can get to like 200, $250,000 a month in cash flow. So I just like you sell real estate because I don't need that cash to come in so I can buy shit down, you know? But today I still buy a single family home. Uh, I build townhouses and I build an apartment building and I keep them all for a rental property. 
I love it. I love it, brother. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So I'm going to ask another question and then I'm going to pass it over to Bo to kind of tee up. Do we have anybody in the in the back studio? Uh, we have Teddy. Teddy there. Teddy Lim, yeah. You want me to put put him in? Bring him in. Let's add, let's do some Q and A, live Q and A. I what sent up, out Teddy? three links, so if you didn't get check your inbox, I sent out three links. Bring in Teddy. Teddy, you're in now. You gotta you gotta show your uh, screen. Can you hear us, <laughs> Teddy? Okay, I don't know where he is. Hey, what up, guys? I'm here. Okay, there he is. Hey. Turn Where's your camera face? on. Are you in witness protection, Teddy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm just uh, I'm just out and about. So, yeah, well, I'll, just, I'll just chime in. I'll just chime in with you guys. Yep. Cool. Ask a, ask a, let's, let's get a good question. I know you, I know you, Teddy. I know you know. I know you know what's going on. So, what, ask it, let, let, what, what kind of question would you want to ask Michael and Thatch here? Oh, man. Um, dude, well, I mean, let me throw let me throw something out to you guys. I mean, what's uh, how do you guys how do you guys keep the fire burning? Because I mean, basically, like especially in these times right now, um, you know, I'm just kind of basically just talking out of um, uh, speaking my mind here, uh, thinking out loud, so to speak. Especially with there's with there's a lot of like unpredictability in the market. I mean, how do you guys keep your eye on the ball? How do you guys keep your eye on the prize? Nice. You know what I mean? How do you guys keep uh, 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 maintaining that big vision for you guys? Nice. Go for it, Thatch. We'll go what Thatch are your thoughts on that? Michael. Yeah, I, I'm going to say for me, Teddy, is I'm just very clear. Like for me right now, I'm really clear. I just turned 50, and I'm super clear on what I want to make sure I am set up for the next 10 years, Teddy. And I have a lot of property free and clear, but a bunch of them are not free and clear. And when this pandemic happened, a lot of the tenants who happened to be living in some of my property who couldn't pay, I had to pay for them. And that was shitty because I got to take care of it. And I told myself, and me and Mark Hammy said, the next 10 years, by the time I hit 60, and there's going to be another correction guarantee again. And I do not want to have to deal with any shit. I just want to make sure I got a lot of cash flow, my shit's free and clear, and it don't make no damn difference what's happening out there, that my shit's paid off, and I'm good, and I'm rolling, and I'm happy, no headache. And so my inspiration right now, Teddy, is to bring a lot of cash to the front door, 1031, some good single family, just a multi-family, and then stop buying because I have enough property now. You know what I mean? I don't need to buy no more. But really, more important, to get them paid off and not stop leveraging them. And that's my motivation for the next ten years. And that's it. And then, of course, my second motivation is just uh, um, stay healthy. And then the third motivation for me is really train my two boys, Hudson and Russell, who's fourteen and twelve, to really awesome. get them mentally, physically, emotionally in this space so that later on when we ever pass away, they know how to do everything themselves. Wow. That's, that's dope, dude. When are we going to see uh, the, the grand opening to Thatch Hotel, man? <laughs> I'm going to stick with apartment building, man. You might see a grand, grand open apartment in Seattle coming uh, next year. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to break ground on a 35 unit building pretty soon. I love yeah. it. Nice. Nice. Cool. I love it. How about you, Michael? How do you stay motivated, Michael? You got all that cash flow, all those units. <laughs> How do you stay well, motivated? Well, the key for me is um, what's not probably clear to a lot of the audience is I had a sales career for the last two and a half decades, high commission sales, 60, 40 splits. Uh, so I've had a number around my neck uh, for almost 30 years, right? So uh, in my world breaks down into 13 week chunks, even to this day after being retired. So every 13 weeks, I set up a health goal, a business goal. Um, you know, what's going on in the market. I, it, and oh, by the way, I track it every week. I report it on my channel every Sunday. I do that because I want to hold myself accountable and I want to show others the discipline it takes. Um, you know, I've been through a crash. I've been through recovery. I've had banks say pound sand. I've had fires. I've had all this stuff. None of this stuff moves the needle for me. It's just about the next deal. Um, you know, so I stay disciplined uh, every day. And I have my goals and I, some, some weeks I don't do great. Some weeks I crush it, but I'm honest with myself each and every week and each and every week rolls up to 13 weeks. And then I reset every 13 weeks, just like I had a big commission number around my neck. Some numbers go up, some numbers come down, some numbers get kicked off and I have new goals. So I'm always challenging myself. I do not do well with these fuzzy goals out in the future. I need 
I need weekly activity or I go nuts. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Michael. Love it. Hey, Teddy, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Ty. I appreciate it, man. I kind of got put on the top, but it's all good, man. Good hearing from you guys. (laughs) Cool, cool. Yeah, that that was great. I, you know, I always struggle this with myself. It's like I look at guys like you that got the cash flow, and it's like that's what I want. Because, but the funny thing is, is you guys work harder now. It seems like in a way, right? Like you're more passionate about everything than you were back in the day. Now it's more about helping and giving back in a sense. I mean, cause you get to a certain point. I mean, how much cash flow do you need in a month? Right. I mean, you're, you're not going to spend it money. I mean, you could build and keep on building. Some people want to become worth a hundred million dollars. Some people say, Hey, I'm good at a $10 million net worth or whatever. Right. So it's all individual, but you know, I think my big why is, is that just waking up and having six figures a month coming in is my why that's, that would be just amazing. Right. Like every, and that feels good. I'm sure you get out of bed and it's like, Oh, that's great. Um, for me, I think I would be good there, um, but when I get there, maybe I'll want more, right? Like, so. <laughs> yeah. The one thing too, and just spending a lot of time with like Thatch and just other people, is that it just seems like when you get to another level, your standards go to another level. Not, I'm not talking about spending either. Like I'm not that. saying spending lifestyle, but just your desire and abilities and standards of just wanting to do more, be more, share more. And that's something I'm learning too. It's so much so I see Michael, he shares and gives. He's just like, hey, can you be on the show? Yeah, no problem. Thatch, yeah, no problem. Hey, Thatch, you know, I got a question about, yeah, no problem. Like Thatch, the, the thing too that I love about with Michael and and with Thatch is that the, the level of contribution and the level of standards, I, I see that is such a big piece of this puzzle. Is that pretty accurate, guys? Yep, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I love it, Bo. Keep going with the cues. Okay, so this is a question for Michael. Michael, you mentioned the opportunities is with single family for the next day, decade. What are you mm-hmm. seeing? Yeah, so that really comes from the fact that, again, I watch my market every day. My information is obviously skewed to Fresno, California. I think it plays across most of the country. Uh, where we're at now is I believe the single family home rental is going to be the thing that you want for the next day for next decade for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, everybody always remembers the last crisis. And what did this crisis teach us? This crisis taught us that space was good. It was hard to shelter in place, even if you were in a class A apartment building uh, versus a house that has a backyard and a front yard. Um, Another thing we've seen in class A apartments is the amenities can be turned off gyms, pools, dog parks, whatever they are that you're paying for in your class A apartments can be turned off when there is this health scare. Um, So I really do believe that we are seeing a transition out of multifamily into single family homes from the most qualified. And this is very, very different than 06, 05, 06. 06, 05, 06 was the least qualified. We're getting liar loans and coming out of multifamily into houses and then ultimately returned to multifamily because they never should have been buyers. What we're seeing now is uh, class A apartment buyers or renters buying. We are seeing millennials in mass realize, you know what, space is good. And oh, by the way, we are seeing, you know what, I don't need to live in a 600 square foot place in New York or San Francisco because I can work anywhere, right? Facebook just put out a note today that says, hey, we will hire the best and brightest anywhere. We encourage people to live out of state. This is going to be game changing for the Bay Area, for the financial, biggest financial institutions in New York are saying the same thing. So we are gonna see an exodus of apartment dwellers and they have the cash, they have the resources to buy and they are going to buy. Then most importantly, I everything I do is about cash on cash return. In my market, as of right now, what is this, May 2020, I can get a better return on my money in a house than I can in an apartment. Apartment, Apartments are still overpriced. Uh, We will see a a cleansing probably in two to three years when bridge debt comes due, cap rates expand, uh, NOIs go down. It's it's going to be murderous in multifamily, in my opinion. And all I'm going to do is exactly what I did in my book, The First Step. I'm going to buy every house I can. I'm going to let prices appreciate, and then I'm going to 1031 exchange into distressed assets and double, quadruple, quintuple my cash flow. So I, I truly believe the single family rental is the name of the game for the next decade. 
Hey, Michael, do you, when you buy single family, do you go after property, single family that's more beat up and then you put some money in rehab it so you create value or do you buy something already done and then just throw a tenant in there? What do you do? So I, I buy what I call junkers, right? Slumlord yeah. properties, you know, um, that need work. That's, yes. that's what I buy, right? Yes. Uh, a lot of the people that follow me in the Silicon Valley don't have the skills, network, bandwidth, you know, 20 years of history. They should buy turnkey or cleaner yeah. properties. Yeah. That, you know, I've got the money, I've got the capital. So I buy junk cash, write a check, send a wire, fix it up, then go get the money back. So it's yep. pretty clean. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do the same thing. That's why I asked. So that's, the, I mean, if, if, if you, if the people out there listening, if you guys got experience with real estate and you got experience with contractor, that is the best way to actually really create value uh, with very little cash. Because if you do it right, you can get most of your personal money back out and you can mm -hmm. recycle that money over and over and over. Over and over. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, though, we have a we have a shortage of housing, right? I mean, bottom without, line, people, without, without a doubt. Question. So without a doubt, I mean, I, I, I you know, it's such mixed reviews at this point, but without a doubt, we have a, a shortage of housing. So people need a place to live. People need a place to rent. At the end of the day, you know, when it, if this market, you know, if we hit a really bad dip, right, maybe I'm in Las Vegas and, you know, the casinos don't open, maybe COVID comes back, right? And then, but at the end of the day, people need a place to live. And, you know, I think, more of the lower end product is what's going to be hit the hardest because those are the people that work at the as waiters and waitresses and things like that right as opposed to class a i mean maybe they have to reduce rents to keep occupancy level there but those people you know want the nicer amenities so it's hard to say nobody's got a crystal ball i mean i'm i'm curious to see it i have a lot of friends that are uh, you know in the multifamily space, right, right, and that's they what they focus on, and they've built tremendous wealth with it. Um, but but right, you know, asset class to asset class, it's it's going to be interesting. I do see people like in San Francisco, right, because San Francisco itself, people are dodging poop on the street and homeless people, and and I think this is really going to create an an urban sprawl, right, or suburban sprawl, or whatever you want to call it. That's I, I definitely see that happening. Mm -hmm. For sure. We got we got William. Uh, can I bring William in? Bring Ty? him in. Bring him in. I know he was in this morning. He was like, Yay! Oh, what up, dude? What up, Dad? How you doing? You. Good to see you guys. Uh thanks. Thanks for having me, by the way. Uh, so I'm I'm still, you know, very much in the beginning of the process, still like, you know, getting as much cash as I can through sales of real estate. However, my question would be, um, you know, as a beginner beginner investor, what are your thoughts on investing out of state, given the whole, you know, having to manage a property and, and all that stuff? We, I mean, Michael, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, I am not a huge fan of investing out of state unless, unless you have your own independent, trusted boots on the ground. Yeah. I'm talking family member. Uh, you know, fraternity brother, somebody that's going to show up at your funeral, right? Somebody that is that meaningful. If okay. you're just investing out of state because you saw some website and some Excel spreadsheet and you're you're thinking you can get a 12% in Detroit in this gorgeous house without realizing the back half is on fire or the next door neighbor is a crack house or whatever it is. Um, I'm not very fond of that. I believe that you can learn your market and find good or great deals in your market. And you got to realize, I'm saying that coming from the Bay Area, right? Mm -hmm. Arguably one of the top two most expensive markets in the country. Yep. What it took for me is a year of beating my head against the wall going, damn it, where's that magic street of cash flow? It doesn't right. freaking exist. It didn't exist in 2003. But what I did is I pulled out a California map and I started drawing circles. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 mm -hmm. minutes. Ultimately, two and a half hours from home, I found a market with half a million people with an average income of 60 grand uh, where you could get the 1% rule back in 2003. So that's what I did. I am not a fan of out of state. I realize some people like it. I realize it's sound. Here's the problem. A lot of investors have made money the last five years and now they're putting out freaking courses. <laughs> uh, 
Yes. Don't and get me have, started on that. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> and they have not been through a crash. I saw people worth $10 million in the last crash that were flippers in the Bay Area. And they thought they were the smartest people in the world. And he was bankrupt once he lost the first house. I know there will be multifamily investors who have bridge loans that bought in 2019 that will be in trouble. I sold apartment buildings to some of them. Um, it's just when something's not affordable, it's not affordable. And you should always go after the best return. Your job, William, is to pick a market and learn the skill of learning a market. It's all about cash flow. Thatch and I are all about cash flow. So figure out every market has an average. My market of Fresno, California in January, the average was 6%. So if I can find a 7 or 8% cash on cash, I should buy it. Today, it's May, it's more like 8 or 9%, right? Because the, the risk reward ratio is different. So that will change. But your job, William, as a young man, is to learn the skill of learning a market, not okay. chasing somebody else's idea of what's great, in my opinion. Got it. I, I want to just interject, and I want Thatch to answer this too. But it, tell them Thatch about the patient game, and kind of uh, like just maybe just kind of the thing you teach with the burr about taking a certain down payment and then the recycling and just and being patient for the young audience. Because I see that a lot of young guys they just want to say, "Hey, I got units and I got doors," <laughs> and they just run out and buy shit. Right. right? Excuse my language, but that you know, a lot of guys just want to say that they own shit and they're in the game. Mm -hmm. Talk to that thatch and then your own spin on the question, please. Yeah. I mean, for me, you guys, you know, uh, I, I consider myself young, you know what I mean? Because I, you know, I, I'm 50 years old, but, you know, I, I walked this journey, you know what I mean? And, and I walked it and I, you know, my hand been dirty, you know what I mean? From day one, and they're still dirty today. So I can tell you um, what I've noticed, William, is that right now with social media, it's just so easy to flex on social media. And everybody want to be like that guy on social media. Oh, man, he got this. He got that. I want to be like that. So all the young people, they don't even realize what it takes to buy a property and to get them paid off. Remember, the typical property, you need to buy something, take 30 years to pay them off. So you ain't going to see no real cash flow until that damn thing get closer to paying off. So the people don't realize, when's the last time you saved 50 grand, 100 grand, or even 500 grand? So if a house costs 700000 and you need four of those, you know what I mean, to have a $10,000 a month of cash flow, you're going to need $2.8 million cash, right? And so people don't even see that, right? And so for me, uh, to answer your question, William, is I I used to think going out of state was the idea because Seattle was very expensive, just like the, you know, the Bay Area. Because yeah. I hear, oh, you can go to Detroit, you can go down to, you know, Alabama, you can get, you know, door for nothing. But see, I'm glad I didn't do it, but I learned my own mistake from Seattle. Because in Seattle, I went out there at the beginning when I had no money, William. I bought property in the area that has little appreciation, but cash flow. But then what happened is 10 years, 20 years later, that property I bought for 150000 only double once in 20 mm -hmm. years. And I wanted to sell it. And after commission closing, I'm thinking, damn, that's all I made after 20 years. And the cash flow was only $300 all those years. And it went a roof for two weeks. And I had to pay a roof. And our money was all gone too. But no one talked about that shit on Instagram. Got and then I, got, I bought an area where I had appreciation, but no cash flow. Right? So all those years, those properties went up in value. But then when a renter moves out, I got to pay for it. You know what I mean? And, and it just wasn't well either. And then I have prop I bought property area where it had no appreciate and no cash flow. And then after 20 years, I asked myself, why the hell did I buy in that goddamn neighborhood in Seattle? <laughs> and so from all those life experiences, I realized if I study the market and you only know your own market well, you don't really know jack shit about Detroit you live in California, okay. right? And so I yeah. studied Seattle well and I knew where I live is very expensive, but I knew 10, 15 minutes away from Seattle. I know what type of property I should buy where I can get appreciation and cash flow. And where what happened to me was that's where I discovered the burr. I buy fixer upper in good area that has appreciation, but it's also in a good area where I get good quality tenant that pay good money. And when I rehab the house in a good area, that property was money, right? But I pay very little mm -hmm. for it. 
but he got good tenant in that area and that found the magic formula and the magic uh uh uh, uh, uh ingredients and in seattle where i can buy a property where i can get cash flow and appreciation and in seattle if you do it right every 10 year double in value and i can guarantee you it has the same thing in california in any neighborhood the problem is young folk don't ever study the goddamn market amen gotcha. learn your market okay perfect I, 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 hey william I, william yeah. i invest out of state and um i don't they have a lot more money than i do but i do i it, it, it it's panned out for me but you know it's a it's a learning curve like anything but curve. but but honestly i think you know thatch at an early age was making you know seven figures a year so he he was building up cash so i think an important thing too is is that you got to get your primary hustle going and make mm -hmm. that money so you can invest locally like for me when i was started investing out of state it was easy for me to buy these and i, and I fund a lot of deals for out-of-state investors so i see uh, you know people that are buying mostly in indiana and texas but i see what they're doing and it's working for them but they have to buy a lot of doors because their average cash flow is probably 250 per door, right? Okay. But and, and the, the burst strategy works and, and it takes less capital. That's right. But but you really have to have a team in place there. I mean, I like the idea of know your you know, know your 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 neighborhood, right? Because it's so much easier. If if you're there, you can go and look at it and smell it and all that stuff. But I think it works, but um, you gotta pick an approach and learn from everybody and then kind of go with what you think you can do based on what you have. So mm -hmm. if you, so Thatch, going back to you. So if he had a little bit of money right now, not so much to get in on a, on a, on a bird deal here, would you say hold off and save your money? Or would you say, well, you know, if he studied a market out of state, you know, would you, and he finds a deal there, would you, would you say go forward? Here's, or would you here's what I know. You don't need a lot of money to buy a fixer upper because hard money lending and, and, and you know, guys, if you buy a house for 300,000, it costs you a hundred grand to rehab it. If if you have little experience, they go, they're gonna ask you for twenty percent down. Well, twenty percent down is eighty grand of four hundred thousand. If you ain't got eighty grand, you don't be fucking around anyway buying no property. You need to save your money. A lot of these guys trying to buy flips and everything with twenty grand. You can't do shit with twenty thousand dollars, right? Go. The thing what people don't realize is this: people are so impatient. They want to jump into an investing when they should be killing the real estate real estate fee game. Collect that money like a damn, you know, oil machine. Just ding, 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 Rack that money in because in your area, you just like Seattle, I can buy a fix for 300, 400,000, 100 grand. Max, I need $100,000 to buy a fixer. Get that value added. Get most of my down payment back out. I'm rolling again. So in my opinion, go sell a lot of real estate, William. Stack up $100,000, go buy a bird property in your own backyard, study your backyard, and you can find the secret, duplicate it over and over, you kill it, baby, in appreciation and in cash flow. Damn, all right. I love it. And, and by the way, he's a hard worker. So this guy's in a prospecting accountability group. <laughs> he's in there every day. He's making his calls from 9 a.m. To, to 12 noon. Back in the afternoon making calls. I see you working, man. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're going to make money, bro. You're yeah, going to make I'm money. Deal, so like, the I wouldn't worry way. about being in a hurry to get into a deal. Yeah. Like that said, and I think collectively, I think there's no wrong way, right? Like Bo's out of state. He's done stuff. I've done stuff out of state too. But I think, again, I think the bigger picture is you got to know your market. You got to work your own plan. But the big thing is don't be in a hurry, right? Okay. Save your money. Stack your racks. Stack your racks and really go in with the right, you know, well capitalized versus being desperate and thin. You know, I think that's the bigger message. Would you guys agree? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to say the real boss. The real boss is the guy that can go generate some cash and know their market and understand the number. That's the real boss and find the good deal. Bingo. Bingo. Okay. Bingo. Right. I love it. Thank you for coming on. Sounds good. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Great job, man. Thank you. Hey, so I want to just say, too, I just want to do a plug right in the middle because uh, did we lose Bo? Yep. Oh, he'll be back. He'll be back. Oh, there I am. There you go. So <laughs> what I want to do is just really I want to plug one of the things I didn't share with you guys. And it's kind of like the commercial break, but it ain't a commercial. Um, this is the last show that Bo and I are doing on Thursday night. So we wanted to go out with a bang for Thursday night. We know that basically it's Memorial Day weekend. We're into summertime. 
And to have people's attention on a Thursday evening, we, we think is maybe challenging. We think also people are pinned up and want to get out. So just, I want all the viewers to know this Thursday night, this is the last of the Thursday night show. And then we're going to relaunch the first week of June and it's going to be an afternoon show. So we're going to still keep the show going. We still want to bring on Thatch and Michael again and again and other great guests again and again. But I want to share that. The other thing too, is I want to just, before we, I, rather than do it at the end, because I think that's what everybody does. I, I want just, just a quick little 60 second plug for what you do, because I know that both of you guys add tremendous value. You do it because you love people. You want to be a contribution. Um, just share with them, both Michael and Thatch, you both have programs. We don't make any commissions or anything. I promote Michael. I promote Thatch because I believe in them and I spend my money. I go to Thatch's events. I help him with his contribution and fundraising. I love what Michael's done. I signed up for his thing too. I, I brought these guys on and I promote these guys because I believe in them. And I know more importantly, these guys add tremendous value. So we'll start with Michael. Just share like what the program is that you do, if people and how they get a hold of you or get involved with you if they want to learn more and connect with you. Yeah, so really I do three things. First and foremost, I do daily original content on my YouTube channel called One Rental at a Time. It's about 45 minutes a day of original content. Uh, we do interviews, both Bo and Ty, you've been on. We are going to get Thatch on as well. So all of that is free, 100% free. Uh, go there, absorb it. There's hundreds, if not thousands of hours of content. I have written a book about being a W-2 employee in tech and how you went from a single house to financial freedom that is on Audible and uh, Amazon. It's behind me. It's called One Rental at a Time. And then finally, I had to create a course because so many people have been asking me, how do you learn a market? It's not as difficult as you think. It takes focus and commitment and daily execution. Uh, so I put out some content. It's about 15 or 20 hours of exactly what I still do to this day. I look at my market every day I have for 20 years. Um, so that's called How to Get Started One Rental at a Time. And it's aimed at the W-2 employee, right? You work a full-time job, stack the racks, get your, you know, I, I, I was selling software, so I know the commission game. So bust your butt during the day, work 68 hours a week, um, you know, spend 15 minutes a day looking at your market. And I show you how to do that, how to compare deals and just start moving forward. So those are three things I do. I love it. I love it. Let's go to Thatch. Thatch, tell them about what, what you're up to and, Tell them about Springboard and Dream Big and all the stuff you do, bro. Yeah, you guys know me, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always on Instagram. I just pretty much just share my life journey. You gotta know my vision is to inspire and empower beings of people to reach for the golden dream and see that anything is possible. So when you got follow me on Instagram, I'm just basically showing you all what I'm doing every day. I got my own goals and dream I go after, and I just go after my own goals and dream, and I just share my journey to inspire you guys to see if I'm doing it, you guys can do it. That's pretty much what I do, and then. Just one friend after another, man. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? And about two years ago, I just created a really simple uh, a company called Springboard. I got two friends that helped me with it, and I just teach people how to figure out how much passive income do you need, when do you want to retire, and then work backward. You're gonna need some kind of cash. You're gonna need to take some action, but then you need to make the knowledge. And the knowledge I teach people is how to actually figure out where the deals are at, how to create your list, know the script. How to evaluate the deal, how to tie it up, how to sell it to build as an investor, make your cash, stack your cash, get your knowledge for free when you work with building an investor, right? And then when you got enough knowledge and the money, you buy your own deal, but everything you buy, you got to make sure it lines up to the number of doors you need so you can actually retire down the road. And, uh, you know, it's just cheap. I just charge very cheap. One time, the whole system, a thousand bucks. And then every week, one hour with me for 150 bucks a month. Okay, get the that. I love it. I love it. And the thing too, and, and what I love too is like in in like two different, right? Two different markets. Michael, very kind of, you know, like he's in Fresno, uh, sharing, giving, fat, sharing, giving. He's in Seattle. Different stories, right? Michael comes from tech. You know, Thatch comes from valet and cars and working in restaurants, whatever. I mean, it's just different, right? But they're both at such a high level. But the big thing is, is they just openly share. And I love to one thing, too, and we're going to go back to questions, but I'm going to pass it back here in another moment, is I love, too, where we talked about Instagram. There's so many. And I love Instagram, by the way. And I love and I got a lot of friends that are very successful that are on there. 
But I can say it's it's truly about a three percent of the people that are there are really doing stuff, mm-hmm. and then everybody's everybody else is pretending that they're doing. Yeah, look at how they do flexing on the gram. Flexing on the gram, right? Flexing. So it's just funny, but these are two of the realists, and that's the thing. That's the one thing, and they're different, right? Lifestyles are a little different. Thatch is into exotic cars, and you know, but I can say that Thatch is the real, you know, he's a real deal. Michael's the real deal. So I want to encourage you guys that no matter what, follow them on social media. If you're looking, you know, like I know some people are looking for mentors and things like that. And I'm not here promoting that. That isn't what this show's about. But I'm just telling you, if you were, I spend my money. I go to Thatch's event every year. And then on top of it, donate because he always makes a charity and a contribution around his live events. And anything Thatch is doing, I want to support. Same thing for Michael, being involved with Michael and being mentored and coached by Michael. So I just want to share that. Back to you, Bo. What more questions? Do we have anybody else standing by in the back? Yes, we do. We're bringing Brian on right now. Here comes Brian. Hey, Brian. Before, that, 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 that had something to say. Though. Yeah. Before Brian asked the question, I want all you guys to know, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on my Instagram Live, my <laughs> next person I'm interviewing with, Tyler Young Guerrero. <laughs> <laughs> So make sure you guys join in tomorrow. Two days in a row. Let me interview Ty tomorrow, baby. Put Shark that in week. The Let's go. Shark Week. That's his birthday. Come Shark on, Week. Baby. Come on, baby. Birthday Come week. On. I'm sorry. We get carried away. We get carried away. I love it. I love it. Brian. Hey, what's going on, guys? Now, I wanted to, Michael brought up my question before I got to it, but I wanted to hear Thatch's opinion, too. Do you think right now is a good time to buy single family homes or like duplex, triplex, fourplex? I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing. I buy in every market, but I know what the market is doing. I know the market is softening. So anytime I buy anything to hold, Brian, hold, I gotta make sure I buy it that after I rehab the property, it has 30% margin. So since the market's going down, I raise my standard up during these time. So anything I buy today has to be 40 or 50% margin. And I only look in certain area. So even if that that property happened to go down farther than I thought it would, but it's in a good area, it's gonna come back up and make no difference because it's in a good area. And in those good areas, rarely you ever find good property. So if I'm going out to 30, 40, 50% margin, and it happened to go down further than 34% margin, which I doubt it. I don't care because it's gonna come back the other way because the property, the place I buy has appreciation and cash flow. And those property right there and those area, it's always gonna rebound. And I'm I'm a long-term kind of a guy, a marathon runner, it makes no difference to me. So you gotta be clear on what you're buying, and then you can decide should you buy single family duplex now or later. And then is it 30% with construction? That's after everything. If I'm all in, if I'm all in a 400,000, right? Take 30% of that. I mean, 400,000 plus 30%, right? That's another 120, add 120 on top of that. So at the end of the day, my property, the ARV is always going to be 30% of what I'm all in at. So if it's a million dollar ARV, I'm all in purchase price and construction at 700,000. So I'm always got 30% margin, everything I buy. And so do you try to burr everything? You don't keep money? Right. That's a good question. If it don't fit 30%, I flip it. If it don't fit a flip, I assign it. If it don't fit an assignment, I list it. So I always start from the top down. When I used to sell real estate from the top, from the bottom up. But now it's everything. Every time I see a good a property, I ask myself, is this a burr? And then if, I, if, I, if it doesn't hit 30%, it's an automatic flip. Then I get rid of it. So that's my standard, how I work. So for for uh, an investor like myself that I'm trying to build a rental a rental portfolio, yeah. do you think I should stay as strict as that as keeping it only you know thirty percent burr keep, or do you think I should be investing some of my money and keeping it in property? Well, the reason why you want to buy fixer upper and Michael will tell you because if you buy some as a fixer after you rehab it, you create a you create extra instant equity in the property. And when you refinance into permanent financing, bank will usually give you up to 70% of the appraised value. 
So if you got 30%, that means you can get pretty much your original money back out because you got 30% equity. But if you only got 20% equity, you got to leave some of that in there. But still, leaving some of it in there is still better than buying something already done and just put carpet and paint and just run. Does that make sense? But like yeah. Mike said earlier, if you have no experience on contracting and you know that never and it never flipped the house before, you better <laughs> off with buying something already done and just park your money. But knowing that if you park your money, you can't take it out. Mm -hmm. So if you need money, it might not be a time to hold yet. Maybe you got money to flip so you can stack your racks before you can actually park your money so you can keep it. Michael, you want yeah, to add yeah, one of the things, Brian, I would ask you, because I get this question all the time, right, from, from new investors, should I buy a fourplex? It's always a fourplex, right, because that is the largest residential loan you can get. So yeah. I'm guessing, just based on the fact I've gotten the question a thousand times, is you're trying to house hack, meaning you're going to live in one of the units and then rent out the other three? That's just a wild-ass guess, so I could be wrong, but that's what I was thinking. No, I own my property that I live in. Oh, I own a couple rentals. Then there you go. Yeah, yeah but he does a lot of flip too. I own single family and I was yeah. like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm building up a lot of cash right now. So That's I'm good. like, should I go okay. start looking at multifamily or just keep doing single family? For me, it's learn your market. Uh, I put, I can put a 500 square foot single family home up to a 20 unit apartment building in the same spreadsheet. And it tells me what the best cash on cash return is. I'm not picky. Uh, some markets, you know, from 2015 to 2019, multifamily won every time. Um, starting in late 2019, single family homes started to win because people were overpaying. They were having um, assumptions about rent growth. Their inner eyes were a joke. They were saying you can operate a 20 unit building at 30 uh, percent expenses. And I was never able to do that for anything less than 45. It's they were just bad assumptions. So I'm not picky. I, I put I put a house a fourplex and a 20 unit building in the same spreadsheet. And I take the highest cash on cash return. Yeah. And I'm and gonna add this, Ryan. I, I, buy, I buy everything, bro. If the number makes sense as a keeper, I'm keeping it. Yep. Exactly. Makes sense. If you can find a good deal on a fourplex over a single family, you got to take down the fourplex. Absolutely. So you got a hell of a good deal on a single family, take down a single family. Okay. okay. I love okay. To get more of a number than it's a single family than multi-family. Correct. Okay. I love Thatch's decision making tree too, by the way. Buy and hold, keep it as a oh, burr, then flip, awesome. then assign it or wholesale it, and then take it as a listing yep. and you know, refer it out to another person for a referral fee or something like that. But it's I love that pyramid, Thatch. I love that. Hey Brian, great job, dude. By the way, Brian is in a an accountability group with us in the morning. And he prospects the guys. He's a hard worker, man. I know this guy. He's, I know he's successful, and he's another guy that's going to be really super successful. How many contracts you get in the last week and a half, or in the in the group? I know you were talking about it I, today. I signed two contracts today, and I kind of, I could have been buying more, but I was nervous about the if prices were going to go down. So I just want to ask one more oh. quick question: Do you guys think we lost him? Okay. Oh. Oh, 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 he's trying to stay in here. Say it again, bro. Say it again. I didn't hear. I didn't hear the question. Do you think prices are going to go down in the next two years? Where? Where are you? California. Where in California? Uh, Inland Empire. Uh, Inland. I don't know. I, I would say actually I'm pretty I'm pretty vocal. I think I think much of California is in for some price hit. I think what we have going on with taxes, with fees going up a fifty four billion dollar hole in our budget means that Prop 13 is at risk. Uh, state taxes could go up. There's a lot of bad things going on in California. And I say that as somebody who's lived here for nearly 50 years, um, I would. I expect prices to go down. I expect prices in Mountain View to go down fifteen to twenty percent, for example. Yeah. Yeah. In Seattle, I work okay. in the heart of Seattle, Brian, and uh, and I, I think it's going to go down about ten percent. But I, I'm I'm literally in the heart of Seattle, and and I don't buy rental in the suburb. I buy rental in the heart of Seattle. So I figure ten percent. But if I'm going out to thirty percent margin or forty fifty percent margin, I'm cushioned well. I love yeah, it. I agree with that. I'll just chime in on that, that thought is the one of the things I've been just people when I'm talking about this specific subject, I would say just really focus in on the median value of any city 
and then really work underneath the median and underneath, you know, in, in the lower, the lower, the further down low under the median of the value, I think just in terms of being able to flip, I think under the, <laughs> under the median value is a little bit safer place to play and a little bit more stable. So. Oh, it's, it's a lot safer to play. I mean, let's just be clear. When you talk about medians and price drops, that's the entire market. Even right. in the Inland Empire, there's a high end, right? There are parts of the Inland Empire that are two, three X the median. What we are going to see very clearly in California is a statistical anomaly where the high end gets hurt the most. The low end's on fire. Even today yeah. in the pandemic where nobody can see anything, it's flying out the door. Yep. Yep. So it's just a statistical anomaly where the bottom end is selling more and the top end is not transacting. And then you do the math, the average falls because the high end always takes us so much higher. Right. It's kind of a statistical anomaly. But but don't play in the high end. That Not today. Don't go 2x the median. That That's dangerous. I love it. Bo. Yes. Here's a question. Can you look? Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, this is a good question for Michael. Mm -hmm. Can you okay? Do you see it? Yeah. So what you do? Uh, what? Yeah. What I? Yeah. So how do you learn your market? Um, basically, what I teach is in the beginning is pick a zip code. So pick a city. Yeah. Pick a zip code. Pick an asset type. For example, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, single story, built between 1950 and 1970. That's 1100 to 1500 square feet. I want people learning the market to find a criteria that produces 40 active listings, mm -hmm. 40, between 20 and 40. And I want you to look at that son of a bitch every single day for 75 to 90 days, because you will see property come on, property come off. People have price drops. People, you know, you, you will start to learn a pulse. And then as you do that, you can either expand your criteria in that zip code or take that same criteria to a sister zip code. Learning your market is not hard. It takes consistent execution and effort. And the market has a pulse. It just speaks to you. It feels unusual. It feels uncomfortable. And again, I'm saying this as somebody who's not a real estate agent. I never had access to the multiple listing service. I use sites like Realtor.com and Zillow with defined criteria, and I hit it twice a day for 20 years. I, I can speak to Fresno better than 99% of the agents. I love it. Oh, love I, want to, it. I want to add this real quick, right behind, right behind Michael. Guys, there's a difference in selling real estate, steady in the market from a realtor and a wholesaler. It's a whole nother mindset to study the market as an investor and as someone who hold property. Okay. So if you're going to spend time being a realtor and wholesaler, study the market, you want to start owning rental, you got to spend time studying it from the angle of a landlord. Okay, really understand that. It's a whole other thing. Okay. Yes, sir. I love it. I love it. Let's go to the next question. All right. I'm calling like crazy, cold calling. What list should I focus on? Vacant, pre foreclosure, etc. <laughs> that was awesome. Ty, who yeah. you, Ty, these days. Ty. Yeah, so um, absentee owners, pre foreclosures, um, zip code, circle prospecting, um, the whole, anything and everything. I mean, you know, also too, this was something. This is something we talked about a couple of interviews. We had Todd Swaggerty on, and this is something that you do a version of it. It's a little different. I like yours is even more intentional. But driving for dollars, I think driving for dollars is brilliant, and. I read this and was talked about where, you know, the best list is the list you can't buy, right? So driving for dollars is where you're driving around and you're looking for, like, I was on an appointment today and I'm on this four lane road, but I see this tall grass and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, what street is that? And I'm like, and I see the cross street and then I get to my office and I pull a map up and then I look and find that house because I didn't have time to stop a four lane highway, you know, 50 miles an hour. But Point being is driving for dollars is the best list because nobody else has it. It's much less competition. You're looking for tall grass, broken down houses, broken down cars, things that look vacant. And then even Thatch takes it a step further. Thatch, tell them about what you're doing with door knocking and kind of private investigator work you do. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's harder for you guys in California, but in Seattle, you know, we have the county record. And on the county record, it shows that 
like this property here. They sell the total house value is nine hundred and like six hundred, six hundred twenty-one, and they said that the structure value is only three hundred and twenty, mm -hmm. and the land value is like three hundred. So if you take three twenty divided by six twenty-one, that's like less than forty percent. So what I do, I tell the title company to give me everything that's a structure value in that zip code <clears throat> that's less than forty percent of the total total value of a property. So when I get the list, all my property from forty percent and less. So I mean, when I get the list, it's already came as already a fixer. Then I do drive a dollar with these. Now I'm driving with a purpose. Love it, love it. In fact, you're door knocking. Tell them just a little bit about. Yeah, for me, what I do is my list is. <clears throat> I usually just call everything, but then I ask myself, if I'm out there buying, then what list should I buy? Right? What property should I prospect? So for me, I'm prospecting fixer in single family zoning with a big 5,000 foot lot because I can yeah. buy, I can keep the fixer. I can put a detached dwelling unit in the back. I'm yeah. also yeah. A fixer on multi family where I can tear down that fixer and then put four or five row houses on this property. And so I'm doing what I call strategically creating lists so that I can buy them myself. And if I can't get the price I want, I can always wholesale it to somebody else. So I, I don't waste time just calling to call. So I specifically create lists for me to buy and I call for me to buy. I don't offer me to buy. And they don't fit what I want or the price don't, isn't fitting. I wholesale them away. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right, we got Ali. Ali, can you hear us? Hey. Welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm a big believer proximity is everything. And uh, just really hearing you guys out, it's very inspiring to uh, to know that all these things are available to us. You know, the question is, are we available to all these things, right? So uh, it's a little bit nerve wracking to be around, uh, around uh, to speak with you guys. Uh, I'm fairly new in the business, uh, about two years. Um, and really, I listen to a lot of the things you, you speak about, Thatcher, and one of my first questions is, you know, you talk about building these relationships with the investors, right? What is the best way to really initiate that and, and, and get into it, uh, you know, build strong investor, relationships with these people where they can tr on a level where they can trust you? Investor that can buy the property from you or investor that can invest inside your project? Well, investors that you can get multiple deals from. Okay. Multiple deal farm, meaning I, I can, I, I can, agent, that I can represent. Yeah. Let me, let me pre-frame the question. Yeah, I, a find bit. Them the, I find them the deal. Yeah. So Ali's connections a little bit. Ali is a hard worker. Yep. He's one of the, again, a lot of these guys I teed up because these are the guys that show in day in and day out prospect. He, he's on the phone five, six hours a day. If he doesn't have appointments, he stays on the phone. The guy's a hard worker, very disciplined, one of the most disciplined. This guy's going to be hugely successful as well. Newer agent, works in a great environment, works in the Ontario Downey office. I mean, he's surrounded. So he's going. To, this guy's going to be really super successful. And I think the question is, Ali, basically, he's prospecting and he's trying to figure out in the matchmaking thatch, yes. how do you find the developers and the investors and the guys that you can assign deals to, yeah. guys that you can double end your listings? And then maybe even later develop relationships where you can maybe do stuff together. Is that kind of what you're saying, Ali? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. So in your area, if you add a downy, there's two types of property that's happening right now in your city. There are fixer houses that be remodeled and then they put it back on the market. And then there's another type of property that's called RD2 and RD1.5. RD2 is that you can put two townhouses on one lot. Or RD 1.5, they can put four townhouses on one lot that's 6,000 square feet because it's 1,500 square foot per lot, right? So those builders, if you notice, they buy those and then they build four townhouses and then they sell them as a pack. Make sense? Yes. So what you got to do is you got to go out there. Just like Michael said, you got to study your market. Say, who, if you pull up the MLS or drive, you see all the remodel houses in the area you work, pull up who are the owner of those property. Make a list of those guys in your area that they that, that they flip houses. And also look at those townhouses right out there, see who's actually buying those and write down who the builder on those is. Now you, you, don't, you don't need a whole bunch of, you only need three or four investor flip, two or three builder in those areas. Once you got those, take them to lunch. Hey man, tell me what you're looking for. What do you buy? What, what's your criteria like? What's your return? You know, what are you looking for? And you take all those notes 
And you go, great. Now you're going to prosper with a purpose. And knowing yes. you got him already in the back end already. Awesome. Great answer. And, and Michael, going back to what you mentioned about knowing your market, LA is a very broad market, right? At what point and how, what, let's just put it this way. If I'm in the city of Downey, how far out of Downey do I want to study the market? Well, again, are you asking that question as an investor for your buy and hold portfolio? Or are you looking to be an agent and, and prospect in all areas? Just so I'm clear. I think as an agent, through? as an agent, yeah. he's, he's, he's an agent first. Yeah. So as hear. an agent, oh, sorry. Can you guys can hear me, right? Bill? I can't hear. Yeah. All right. he's, yeah, he's, so, yeah. So yeah. that's okay. So, yeah. I think just, I think both. And I know Ali aspires to, own, to build a rental portfolio. Yeah. But, but I think just getting Michael's twist on it and like, you yeah, know, I mean, I mean, are you doing all of Fresno or just the city limits or? Well, what I would tell an agent to do is, is I would, again, LA is kind of large, right? It's the largest in the metro. And, and so I would not just do Downey. I don't even know where Downey is, frankly. Um, I would, I would probably go in 60, 75 minute drive, that kind of circumference. Uh, so that's maybe half of LA, but here's the key. I would tell you when you're looking for investors to buy multiple projects, we don't hide. We don't hide. Uh, all you have to do is look up who's doing transactions in that market. Uh, look up cash buyers. Um, you know, then what you have to do when you call us is you have to understand what we do. Some of us want to flip, right? Some of us want to burn. Some of us are straight up slumlords. Um, you have to figure out who is on the other end. So I get phone calls almost every day from agents or wholesalers uh, in my market. Literally three times a day, I must get 50 mailers a day or a week. Um, but nobody is asking me a question. What are you looking for? What would you buy? What is your return? Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is calling me saying, hey, do you want to sell this house? Do you want to sell that house? Fucking throw that shit away. If you want to be involved with me, take the time to understand me. Ask what I look for. Shoot. Ask, why did you buy 609 South B Street? Why'd you buy that? What did you see? What are you doing with it? Oh, by the way, I drove by it. I seen you put on a new roof. You changed the paint color. Show that you are putting in work and understanding what I'm doing. And I'm going to return that phone call. I have never returned a phone call from an agent or a wholesaler that says, hey, I saw you own property X. Can I list it for you? Delete. If you call me and say, hey, I saw you bought this. I see you're doing this. I drove by. Here's a picture I took for you. You're going to get my attention. If you put in work and you try to learn what makes sense to me, I'm going to add you to the list. I have 10 to 12 agents in Fresno who I've invested time with. I return their phone calls. Shoot, I pick up their phone calls. <laughs> I love it. That, that is a great answer, too, because you are the you are the well that, you know, that we're that Ali is looking for. I mean, I think that's a great answer. Did that help, Ali? He, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. You're muted but, out, buddy. I love you. Great job. We can't hear you, but we'll see you tomorrow morning. Great, great questions. Thank you. And you know, another great thing to find to find buyers. I mean, look at like Brian. He's he's in your market or close to your market. He's just telling you he'll buy your deals. I mean, you just go to your go to a local real estate meetup and find the guys that are actually guys and girls that are actually closing deals. Yeah. One thing too, just for Ali, because I know he'll either watch the replay on this. And I think it's a good question because it's appropriate for, I'm sure, a lot of the listeners, a lot of the people watching is that like Danny Navarro, right? That's somebody that I know has spent a ton of time with Thatch. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago. I know I've spent a lot of time with Danny. Danny's one of these guys where he literally was agent. Then, you know, working with Thatch, he learned how to like work with investors and developers. And then now he's got his own projects and nice. building his own portfolio. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dan, Danny, like from our last interview, he's doing exactly what all he needs to be doing or wants to be doing. So they should they yeah. should squat up, as Ty <laughs> says. They should squat, squat up, baby. Okay, here's a question from uh, Su Jing Zhang. What did you do to network with and partner up with trustworthy general contractors? Do-do-do! 
<laughs> Trustworthy at contractors. I don't know no, how they go. Sober, too. Sober. Put the word sober in there. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I love the contractors. I'm just kidding. Who you want to go first? Michael, go ahead. Uh, so um, I wish there was a magic answer for general contractors. You, When you're first starting out, you've got to ask for referrals. Uh, what I always found in the beginning is drop by their existing job site. Mm -hmm. because what they are likely doing at your existing or their existing job site is what they will do at yours for the most part. Um, never accept just one in the beginning. I made that mistake, just got a single bid right in the beginning, go talk to two, three or four. And again, stop by their job sites, ask for referrals. Don't ask for referrals from the contractor because then they're going to give you their cousin and their uncle and their mailman, but ask your network of other investors who they recommend. And then the other thing that you've got to know about general contractors is they're people too. Uh, I remember working with a general contractor on 18 projects in a row, on time, on budget, if not and on quality, right? The kind of magic triumvirate. But then life happened. Um, he, he had some family things go on and suddenly delays happened and then money went disappearing and then he disappeared. Mm -hmm. So just because you find a good track, good contractor don't think you've solved the puzzle you have to keep networking um you need to have a backup i have i have two teams going at all time and i have five or six ready to slot in if i have to so um unfortunately contractors are people too life happens to all of us um so you're never quite done in my opinion yeah mark can i have no more to that one that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Ty, why don't you kind of, I mean, we're past our hour mark. This okay. has been an, an amazing night, but why don't you kind of bring this uh, full circle here? I, I just, a uh, couple things. I just want to, I want to thank everybody who's watching. Again, about 30 minutes ago, we, we talked about, this is the last Thursday night uh, Facebook Live that Bo and I are doing. We're going to be moving it, or we're going to relaunch on June the 2nd at 1 p.m., so June the 2nd at 1 p.m., we're going to take next week off. It's a holiday weekend. We're taking next week off, and then we're going to relaunch. It's going to be a Tuesday recurring show, 1 p.m. Lots of guests. If you guys have suggestions on guests or people that you want, and I don't care how high level or how beginner or just somebody you know that's doing big things, and more importantly, somebody who's about contribution, somebody who's a sharer and a giver, a go-giver, please inbox me, inbox Bo. We want to, we want to, I'll find them. I'll track them down. I'll get them on the show. So please share with that. Um, we just, I want to thank everybody for who watched. We did this because we wanted to, um, the whole purpose of this was contribution. We knew eight weeks ago when everybody was shelter in place, we needed it for us, but we also knew that there's a lot of people out there that need inspiration, need some guidance, need some coaching. And you know, maybe, maybe couldn't afford it, you know, or maybe just, you know, economically the money's a little tight and you like, Hey, I'm not signing up for a program. We wanted to give, we wanted to give something and give a ton of value and we're going to continue to give. So for any of the real estate agent and prospectors and people that are proactive, please inbox me because I want to invite you. We have a free accountability group, 9am to noon. We do prospecting daily Monday through Friday. I want to encourage, and I want to go back to, I want to thank Thatch, I want to thank Michael. I want to go to Thatch. Thatch, tell them specifically how do they find the Springboard for Wealth? What's the website for it? Oh, uh, just go to my Instagram, guys. In my bio, that's it. Real simple. Got it. So he, go to his Instagram. It's in the bio. If you want more information on that, Thatch is awesome to follow. He shares tons of great content. He does what Gary Vee talks about: documenting the journey. Same thing with Michael. Michael, one more time. How can they get a hold of you? I'd go to YouTube one rental at a time. Love it. And then Bo, if we need money, if we need some hard money or we need commercial lending, how, how do people get a hold of Bo? I'm going to put it up in the screen right now. <laughs> I, I, like to be, I like to be called, texts, anything you guys want. But uh, you there guys he is, right there. There's Bo's there mobile number. Call him, text him. And you do stuff all over the country, right? It's not just California, Nevada. Yeah, yeah nationwide, nationwide. So, you know, I like to... Um, you know, the great thing about what I do is I get to get in the minds of all these different investors, like my buddy Vinny Chopra, who owns, you know, three or four thousand units and he's buying in emerging markets. And then I'm learning from guys that are doing ground up multifamily projects. Then I'm learning from people that are, um, you know, they own 200 rental properties. Actually, 
just spoke to a guy that owns 200 rentals in Fresno. Um, <laughs> and um, we talked for a while, but he called me because I think he must have heard your segment on Las Vegas because he, he goes, hey, how's the Vegas market doing, right? Because <laughs> Michael did, my, you know, Michael interviewed this uh, realtor out here about what the market's going to do because, you know, obviously the casinos are closed. And this this is probably one of the markets that might be stressed the most. So there might be some opportunity. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always learning. But I want to get into your, your account, accountability group, Ty, because that's what I need. I need yeah. – I, I, my problem is, is that I have get all these great ideas and then I, I don't do, I don't do the one thing that I need to do. So I need, I'm going to pay somebody to coach me or maybe I can get in your group for free. That's fine. Yeah. You're in for free, bro. You got You got a lifetime <laughs> membership. Man. You got a friends and family free membership. So no, we would love to have you. Um, I just want to say, Hey, great job, Bo. Bo's the one that got this all started. He's the one that's been podcasting. He's the one that's been doing bar camps and real estate investment clubs. And we just want to take it to the next level. Squad up. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Thatch. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, guys. We'll see you on Tuesday, Tuesday, June the 2nd. Follow Thatch tomorrow, 12 p.m. We're going to go live. And I know it's going to be fun if Thatch is there. <laughs> Come on, baby. Me and Kylie Young Guerrero, baby. Let's go. Let's go. Take